Welcome everyone uh, to this Center on Governance and Markets. This is our series on the economics of race and identity. And um, my name is Jennifer Brick, which is Ashvili. I'm the director of the Center for Governance and Markets and a professor here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, just very briefly about our center, um, our mission is to understand the diverse institutions and governance arrangements that affect social order and human well-being in the US and around the world. We generate knowledge and, with, and the ways in which individuals and communities overcome challenges to living free, prosperous, and peaceful lives. We do, do this through cutting edge research, through policy engagement, and through real world engagement with the real world community engagement. So it's a real pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today, Vincent Geloso, who is Assistant Professor of Economics at King's College in Canada. And his research interests lie at the intersection between North American economic history, population economics, and political economy. And today he's going to present his paper, The Incubated Revolution, Education, Cohort Effects, and the Linguistic Wage Gap in Quebec from 1970 to 2000. And it's an enormous honor to have uh, Professor Allison Schertz here with us today from the Department of Economics here at the University of Pittsburgh. She's one of our center's faculty affiliates. She'll be moderating the discussion uh, providing some feedback uh, to Vincent and uh, leading us through the rest of uh, the discussion today. So without further ado, Vincent. Okay, so hi everyone. It's a pleasure to, to engage with you. I'm very excited. It's uh, even though it's in these weird times of the COVID and, and everything. And uh, as I prepare the share screen that will show you my, my talk, it's kind of a good idea to start with uh, how this paper basically started. So uh, this paper was started between me, uh, myself, Marie-Pierre Isabelle, and Julien Gagnon, and it started when we were basically undergrads. Uh, so it's a long time in coming, and we've had some uh, some some uh, some glitches along the way, and the two of us got a kid. So I'm not calling kids glitches, but uh, they put the plan uh, a little awry, and this is the version that we're not comfortable with presenting, and we think it's... Uh, the time that we took for it actually allowed it to mature into something that we think has a great importance, not only in terms of the, uh, the economic history of Canada, because the object is about Canadian economic history, uh, but the way we formalize our reasoning actually can be imported into other fields of inquiry and, and economic history, uh, including uh, the United States. So um, when we talk about Canada, there's this depiction of two groups, one French, one English, and the French minority in Canada is not a small minority, it's a large minority, uh, roughly a quarter of the population today of Canada is French, and they're generally concentrated, they're disproportionately concentrated in the province of Quebec. But strangely, within Quebec, the English minority is actually, and for very long, was much richer than the French uh, majority. And this is just uh, the graph I'm showing you here is kind of to give you an idea of what was happening. And this is weekly earnings uh, from 1901 to, uh, to 2001. And they're expressing weekly earnings between francophones and anglophones in Quebec and more precisely unilinguals. So by the way, if I say the word francophones, you it's French speakers and anglophones is English speakers. And these are for those born in Canada and there was a long uh, gap that existed uh, for a long time, and this is in weekly earnings. Uh, when you're able to take hourly earnings, you see that there was a long historical gap that existed between French speakers and English speakers in terms of wages. But then in the 1970s, this gap began to close very rapidly. So it collapsed. You can't see it very well on this graph because it's weekly earnings and it doesn't capture the differences in the intensity of work by both groups. But when we shift to hourly earnings, this is the picture that comes out and the line that I'm gonna try and attract your attention to is the dashed line. And the dashed line is the gap between French and English speakers. And you can see that uh, starting from a gap of roughly 25% unadjusted, there's, there's no regressions yet, uh, there is a rapid convergence that happens in a span of 30 years, but a large share of it is concentrated in the decade from 1970 to 1980. And in Quebec, the, the general explanation that is provided for that big jump 
is it coincides with a rise of French Canadian nationalism. While there was always a certain French Canadian nationalism, this is the shape that actually brings the first formal separatist movement who is intent not only on separating Quebec from Canada, but also on establishing the French group as not only culturally dominant, but also economically dominant in the narratives. And in the 1970s, when, for example, the Parti Québécois, this is the separatist party, take over uh, power in, uh, in Quebec, and one of the things they do is they start having programs for hiring uh, French Canadian workers. And the general argument in that sense is that the growth of the state combined with nationalism caused the gap to collapse because it was an increased demand for uh, French workers. Uh, Alison, you're Can I right. ask a quick question? Can you go yeah, back yeah. a slide? Sure. So I certainly agree with you that the major decade of interest here would be the 70s in terms of um, Francophones gaining on Anglophones and earnings, but isn't the second biggest story the decline after 1980 in Anglophone earnings? Should I think mm -hmm. about this in the same way? Uh, so this is, uh, this is paralleling the, so this is, by the way, I should have added this detail. Uh, this graph is only male workers. Uh, so I'm only, I'm only showing the male workers in, in this graph. And for most groups in Canada, male workers, their earnings are actually flatlining on an hourly you basis. You mean M-A-L-E workers? Yes, male. Uh, okay. Man. Okay. Sorry. Um, I, I don't know if it came out wrong, but I mean, like no, sorry, we're just thinking about the other kind of male workers with an I here a lot right now. Um, oh, so male. Oh, okay, no, 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 sorry. Male and in the sense of, yes, gender, I mean. Okay, because this is, I mean, after 1980, it looks like you're closing disparities by actually having the Anglophones earn less <laughs> rather than having the Francophones catch up. Um, yes, this is something we can't, we're not able to explain. Uh, why, like, I don't, I, we're, we haven't focused on the absolute decline, and I don't have a ready answer uh, for this, except that we see the same thing, and the only answer I have is that we see the same thing in all the other provinces. So, earnings for males 20 to 64, so full-time working males, uh, basically, it's, it has the same trend for everyone, but indeed, the Anglophones in Quebec are filing more uh, than the Francophones. So perhaps I could add something uh, on this subject. Um, uh, the Parti Québécois was elected first in 1976, and uh, between about 1978 and um, maybe the mid 80s, 400,000 uh, Anglophones left oh, yeah. Quebec, and they were probably earning more than the median, in fact, or more more than the average. So that might uh, explain part of the decline in the English uh, uh, wages. Uh, I guess that was Germain. I recognize the accent, but uh, yes, that's also an answer. Uh, but I don't want to focus. So here's the thing: I, by virtue of what I'm about to say, the uh, the argument that I'm having is that the 1970s is, in any case, what we not what we should look like, look at. Sorry. So the explanation that is generally provided is this one is the dominant one is this rise of is increasing labor demand because of a rising size of government that is combined with nationalism and hiring French Canadian workers. There are other explanations such as uh, cultural changes amongst Francophones. That was a bigger deal in the 70s as an explanation. It was basically arguing that Francophones were culturally inferior, uh, but there's been so much work, uh, including some of mine, but also some by uh, Marvin McInnes and Frank Lewis uh, in economic history that have shown that there's, there, there has never been any form of cultural differences that mattered in terms of economic outcome or efficiency. Uh, but the one explanation that uh, is also often put as a rival to the growth of the state is the greater education of, of Francophones uh, in that period uh, that the Francophones are actually growing more and more educated. And the other two explanations, uh, the lesser discrimination uh, is tied to the growth of the state. And one explanation that has been forgotten and that I'm gonna try and bring back in a way here is that there's a, that we need to view each group as kind of social networks. 
So just hold these explanations in your head for just like a quarter of a second. And let me just try and tell you that the graph I showed you just before is missing the entire story. Because the graph that was shown before takes the aggregate of the French of all groups. And it's saying, look, you see this big, pretty steady increase with a big, big fast increase in the 70s. But when you break down the data by cohort, so you look at younger groups and you plot the wage gap between groups, what you find is that there is no convergence over time. What you have, so within cohorts, there is no convergence over time, but each cohort is uh, closer. So each francophone cohort is a closer in terms of its wages to the, the anglophones within the same BERT cohorts. So you kind of see this, sorry, the staircase pattern that we have here. So it starts with the older cohort with very large wage gaps, then the next cohort has a smaller one, and then a smaller one, and then a smaller one, and then a smaller one. And then when you get to the youngest cohort, there is no longer a gap. And if you think about how this would translate into the other graph I've shown before, is that there's just a de demographic composition bias. The younger groups didn't compose a large share of the population of the workforce in 1970. And as you move over time, the younger cohorts that have a smaller wage gap become a larger and larger proportion of the overall workforce. So that the graph we're seeing that I showed you initially is somewhat misleading because it's capturing changes in basically who is in the French Canadian population. And so this pattern has rarely been noticed. Uh, uh, if you open the articles that have been on the topic of the wage gap between francophones and anglophones, this staircase pattern has never been mentioned. This idea of breaking it down by age group uh, isn't uh, studied uh, in, in any way. Generally, the argument is that uh, there is uh, that convergence that happens and most of it happens in the 70s. Uh, but the argument here that we're gonna, uh, that we point out is that something has to be explained that's much before the changes of the 70s and, uh, and that leads me to what the claims that we're gonna make, is that we can take two of the existing explanation and tweak them just a bit. And the tweak we're gonna do is that it relates to the role of education and each Anglophones and Francophone groups as kind of social networks. And if we tweak those explanation by introducing the role of an important reform in 1943, and that reform is compulsory education. Quebec is the last province in Canada to adopt compulsory education. It is the last province to introduce a minimum age to enter school and a maximum age, sorry, a maximum age to enter school and a minimum age to leave school. So Quebec is the last province and not just like by an inch, the last province, the last province by many decades. Uh, 1943, it's actually the last district in all of America, in, Nor in all of North America, that adopts a, a strong uh, uh, compulsory education. And that fact that the introduction of compulsory education, we are going to argue, is what causes this staircase pattern to happen, where the younger cohorts are converging. Uh, each, so the younger Francophone cohorts are converging with their Anglophone counterparts. Okay, so I've. Um, I've Vincent, a, yeah. interrupt. But but the young also are, I don't know about Canada, but aren't they employed in more kind of less specialized? I mean, are they kind of? If you see differences in, in in occupation and probably divergence in occupation. So as you go. Um, yes. Uh, so in the way we tell the story, so this, this paper has a structure that I'm I we've tried for the first time, and I can see where you're going is you're asking kind of, are we controlling for industrial structure? And the way we're telling the story is by pointing out these two facts to motivate our story. And then we do some first set of regressions to see if this purely graphical way of framing our, our narrative is actually supported. So uh, what I'm gonna show you like literally uh, next is where I, we start controlling for notably uh, the type of industries in which they work, the types of work that they engage so that we get the all else being equal wage gap. Uh, following the methodology that uh, everybody else has used, so we keep comparability with the other papers in the field, 
uh, notably those of, oh, you guys are, must be seeing the, the pictures as well. So you're not seeing all of it. Okay. Um, uh, we use the censuses that uh, Albuy, Nado, and Vaillancourt and all have used, and we use like them uh, full-time adult male workers, which is what they use. We get roughly 132,000 observation, and we control for uh, uh, bilingual. Are you bilingual or not? Are you uh, in what industry do you work? We use NAICS codes. Uh, we control for age, obviously a, quarter, uh, a term for experience that we add uh, to the age, uh, uh, the level of education, and we're able to plot the, basically the wage, we're doing, we're doing mincer regressions. And let's, the first thing, so we're basically the first thing we're doing is, does this kind of staircase also work when we're holding all else being equal? And do we find that the wage penalty shrinks over time or even reverses when we're adjusting for everything else. And what we find is, and if you look that, so there's two types of regression that we do. One is that we have no uh, interaction term between the census year that we're using and whether you're a francophone and where we're adjust, uh, adding this control. And it's just to be robust to see how, if there's some form of, uh, if the francophones basically are more likely to not be in uh, to not be fully employed, for example, in the census of 1980, uh, when there's a recession uh, that's happening. So it could be that there's like a selection bias. So we're trying to control just a bit uh, by this. But these two panels confirm the story of the staircase that we were mentioning is if you look at the wage penalty, all else being equal, it starts from for the oldest cohort from somewhere between 18.5 and 20 percent uh, and always significant it gradually collapses until it reverses at least for the 1940 to 50 cohort. So those who are born from 1941 to 1950, and actually it becomes positive and significant uh, thereafter when we have the uh, year francophone interaction term as an extra control to all of those that we already had, we find the same story. It's not as even, but it does collapse over time and reverses by the cohort that is born in the 1950s uh, and uh, is uh, afterwards significant, is actually also afterwards positive. So what we find is that older cohorts do have a negative, uh, do occur, older francophone cohorts do suffer a wage penalty, all else being equal. And so this further motivates the idea that we need to find an explanation for why is it that the older groups have a particular wage penalty and not the younger groups who have an diff entirely different set of premium slash penalty because for the, other, the, the, younger, the younger groups we're talking actually about maybe even a premium on being a francophone. We must be able to explain this. And here we're also arguing, by the way, that uh, for example, discrimination can't really explain why only older workers would be discriminated and not younger ones. So uh, once we present this, uh, we are somewhat at, at uh, well, not somewhat, we're actually confirming the idea that something must have happened that precedes the 1970s because the groups that are uh, getting the, the, the smallest wage penalty over time are people from the 19, from born in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, so what explains that transition? And in the way I want you to kind of picture this in your head is imagine that before this is an equilibrium that existed, and this is like a new equilibrium that emerges by the 70s. And there is a change in, in the interceding period that we must explain a transition to a new form of equilibrium. And here, I don't want to take credit because this is Julien's great idea. Because when we started that paper, we couldn't explain it. And Julien had this great idea in the way to summarize and in a way to modelize the, this transition from one set of equilibrium to another. And his idea was this. And I really want to point out this. I, I thought it was elegant when he first phrased it. I was so excited because it unlocked so much about for the paper. He said, Let's see it as two economies, two sectors, French and English. These two sectors have perfect mobility of capital. Capital can move between them, but labor is immobile 
because you need to acquire the language of the other sector to move into it. And that means that human capital is also immobile. If you have human capital in the English sector, you can't move it to the French sector. And if you have human capital in the French sector, you can't move it to the English sector unless you incur the cost of learning the language of, of the other group. There were some economists who tried to frame it as such in, in the 70s, uh, but they never pushed and the idea never popularized. Uh, but that's, so that's the kind of the setup of the model. And now you have to imagine the Yes, sorry. Uh What's an example, say, of a French sector and an English sector? Just uh, kind of, I'm not familiar with Canadian. Um, yeah, what would be a French sector, say? Um, a French sector would be generally, so that the industries in which French were generally concentrating were low capital industries. Uh, uh, so you're thinking, let, when I mean low capital, those that had very le relatively low fixed costs in terms of initial capital outlays. Uh, the ones in which the Anglophones concentrated were the ones where large capital outlays were, were necessary. But uh, so that's, yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I lost track of where I, yes, okay. Uh, the, the one element that is necessary here to understand because now I've just presented two economies with immobile, two sectors with immobile labor that can't move easily between them, but it wouldn't be a problem unless there's the following two facts that are of historical importance. The first one is that the English group was always more educated in Quebec than the French group. And that was already from only from migration, even in the 19th century. Uh, English migrants who came to Quebec were generally more educated than the French Canadians who were already there. So you get a disparity in an education that was already historically there. But the other part that's important is that human capital is complementary to physical capital. If, if there is that complementarity, uh, but the immobility of human capital, there is greater returns to capital in the English sector than in the French sector. And the other part that comes in is that French, that capital should flow from the French sector to the English sector. So that creates an asymmetric equilibrium where in the French sector, you have low capital per worker and low human capital per worker, and it persists over time. And in the English sector, you have high capital per worker and high human capital per worker. The rates of return on education are greater in the English sector than in the French sector. And these two equilibriums persist as long as there is either a large cost of moving between the two sectors. So for learning the language, oh, sorry, that's my Amazon coming. Sorry about the, the noise in the background. Uh, this, uh, the, the downsides of, uh, of, uh, of Zoom presentations. Yes, so capital could move, so the, 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 asymmetry, the asymmetry could be broken if the cost of moving between the two is reduced, or if by a shock, education in the low education sector, here I mean francophones, goes up. And this is where you can already see where my law of 1943 that I was mentioning is going to, to jump in. The law of education is going to be my source of breaking the symmetry in terms of equilibrium. So you get, rather than having two e equilibriums that are different for each sector, you're gonna have a single, you're gonna have the French equilibrium move closer to the English one, even though there's still a cost for moving between them. There is still the same cost over time of learning French uh, and English. Uh, so this asymmetric equilibrium uh, uh, would, uh, sorry, this symmetric equilibrium would uh, if there is, uh, would allow us to explain why there is an older group that has a wage penalty and a younger group that has a wage premium for being francophones. And the, the law of 1943 is the one that, as I said, where we put a lot of em emphasis on, is it that, as I said, it was a law that was adopted after most of, not most, all of the other Canadian provinces had adopted their own compulsory law they also reduced the cost of education, so now it was taxpayer funded rather than having to pay fees. Uh, and the other part is that uh, the uh, the the sorry the 
the minimum age was, or sorry, the, the maximum age for entering your, your kid at school was finally established in Quebec because before what you could is technically register and not actually send your kid to school. So att effective attendance was relatively low because people said, yeah, he's registered, but he's not in class. Uh, so it wasn't enforced. And in 1940, not only is it enforced, not only is there a minimum age, a maximum age for sending him in and a minimum age for leaving, uh, uh, they also enforce it very effectively. There's penalties for parents who send their kids to work. Uh, and what happens is that when you when the law is passed, it basically means that everyone that um, that was born after 1937 was bound to go to school until age 14. And just to give you an idea, because I just saw Allison raise her hand, I'm just gonna finish that sentence and answer Allison. To give you an idea, uh, the average age at which French Canadian would go to school prior to that point was until age 11. They would generally start dropping out on average at age 11, which is incredibly low. Uh, either they dropped out entirely or sometimes they dropped out half so that they worked on the side, they had some days at school, they never completed. Uh, so completion rates were incredibly low amongst uh, French Canadian until that reform. Yes, Alison. So I'm just reminded of like the only other thing I know about education in Quebec, uh, which is that, so you're arguing here that this is gonna be a shock that will force these French Canadian kids to acquire more human capital. But the, the other policy change that seems really relevant for understanding those cohort trends that you document is this, so this is 1977, when they force everyone, like there's a compulsory schooling law that forces all kids to go to school in French, which yes. would have two effects of inducing a lot of presumably Anglophone out migration, and then also increasing the returns to being a Francophone because now everyone should be, either because they were treated by schools or because if they refused to be treated, they left. This should return, increase the returns to French in the labor market. Yes, if we had done something bad in the paper, which is that we would have included foreign born workers. Because the goal of the, so the, the 1977 law, so this is known as Bill 101. Bill 101 says that you have to send your kids to French school unless your parents went to English school, right? Okay. So, so that basically applied only, in practice, it only applied to immigrants. But for anyone who was an English, English speaking born Canadian, they had already went to English school and already sent their kids to, to English school. So the goal of Bill 101 is often construed as making sure French didn't go to English schools. They, they never went to English schools, uh, largely because there was this uh, discomfort between French and English. The idea was to prevent the immigrants from selecting into the, uh, the English speaking schools. But our, our, the way we cut our data is we exclude foreign borns. So we're not affected by, by this. Maybe we are capturing a bit of what you were mentioning. Because it changes the language of commerce elsewhere. Like all of these immigrants would have chosen to speak English if they could. Yes, and I have a reply for this in two slides, which is okay. that the increase in the propensity to use French as a language of commerce precedes Bill 101 by a large margin, even in a sector that was historically English, such as finance. So I'm going to show this in like a minute. So it, it, if I didn't see this other factor, I'd be very worried by your comment. But because of what I'm about to mention in a few slides, I'm like, I'm super excited because I have an answer for okay. like five years. And like, it's one of those papers where I feel like I have an answer for literally everything. And so I'm very excited about it. And the answer is- <laughs> Okay, I'll wait then. Okay, but I, I, I promise satisfaction. Uh, so. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm trying. I'm okay. So I'm very excited about presenting this paper. So I hope I hope it's coming out correctly. Okay. So just to give you an idea of how big the persistence in education happens, this graph uh, shows persist. So uh, the percentage of the French population relative to the English population that at least has a high school degree. And you can see that while there was a somewhat of a convergence beforehand, there is a rapid convergence afterwards. So the French close the gap between themselves and, and Anglophones. So there is a, a rapid increase. And that graph is actually understating things because not only do we find that, uh, that the French are like catching up with the English within Quebec in terms of educational outcomes, uh, when you look at rates of high school completion, 
they triple. Like they triple in the span of 15 years. From 1945 to 1960, uh, high school completion rates triple from the low 20s to the high 60s. Uh, so that's like a, a very impressive, very fast convergence that happens in education. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing is now that I, I've presented this, how important as a, as a shock the law is, if our mechanism for saying that before the law, there was a particular equilibrium and there's another equilibrium after the law where the two sectors are closer together. Well, there are to be four key observation that we must also see for our model to apply. One of them we've already shown, which is that the wage penalties are monitored. I can never say the word properly. Monotonically, it was really bad in intermediate micro when I was trying to say monot that word. Uh, it's, I, I never can say it. My brain just uh, blocks. Monotonically declining wage penalty. Uh, we've already. Thank you, thank you, Andreas. I, I saw the little clap. That was a lot of effort for saying a very simple word. But the the wage penalty should collapse over time. That's one of our four key observations that we should see for our model to have economic relevance. There, the other three are very important and much more important than the wage penalty. The first one is that we should see an increase in the relative stock of capital of the, Fran so of the francophone sector relative to the anglophone sector. Number two is that we should, see the, we should see rising returns to education for francophones relative to anglophones. So that there before, one of the key assumptions of the model is that because of the immobility of capital, of human capital, because it couldn't move between sectors, but because human capital was complementary to physical capital, in the English sector, you would expect a higher rate of return to education and regressions. You should see that it gets a, a bigger return overall. Uh, so uh, that's the first part. If the, the, the equilibrium is broken, that difference between the rates of return of education for francophones and for anglophones, should, uh, should the, the gap between them should fall. And the last one, and that's the key important one, is that there should be falling return to bilingualism. Because one of the assumptions of the model that we made is that you could move between them, right? So the moving between them depends in part about how attractive wages are in the other sector so that you are willing to incur the cost of learning the language. If we are correct, we should see the returns for, for learning uh, English, uh, the returns to being bilingual, should fall over time, and we should also see rates of French bilingualism fall. And also, by the way, we should also see rates of English bilingualism increase. All of these four key observations, we see them. So let's do the capital accumulation part, and that's where I can, I, I can provide at least the satisfaction I've promised Allison to my so I can be true to my word. Uh, the last bullet point here, it's the French ownership of business. So the percentage, there is a survey, it's a really famous one by uh, Francois Vallancourt of the University of Montreal. And what he did is take the largest, I think 500 businesses in the province and check who the majority owners were. Uh, French, English, uh, and when he said English, it was English foreign and English Canadian. And French was basically, well, French Canadians. Uh, and what you find is that for the overall economy, even though they compose 80% of the population in Quebec, in 1960, you find that uh, half, 47%, is um, uh, of the largest businesses are French owned. Uh, by 1978, it's 55%. But the increase is even crazier in the most English of world. So in kind of the lore of Quebec history, uh, finance is the world of the English. Everything, like the, the lesser things go to the French. That's, the, like, that's kind of the analogy that comes out in kind of the political lore. And you can see that in the fact that as of 1961, for example, uh, the owners of the largest financial firms in the top 500, only a quarter of them were French speakers. 15 years later, just before Bill 101 is passed, close to 45% of them have majority French owners. So you see that there's already a shift in the propensity to use French prior to the big linguistic laws that could have been worrying, but because we're seeing that first shift, uh, we're seeing that the francophones are a uh, getting more involved in high uh, in large industries. Uh, 
The other two things that we see is that we also see a, a substantial increase in the amount of capital that is in French Canadian ANS, either by the fact that overall financial activities in Quebec increased massively in that period, but also that the French banking network that's largely around what is known as the Caisse des Jardins grows to rival long established banks. Uh, so this is the Caisse Populaire, uh, Caisse des Jardins is like a credit union. And the credit union by 1961 is bigger than the largest Canadian bank in that province. Uh, so it's a big, big network of French Canadian capital that's emerging. Uh, yes, Desiree. Yeah, the, the convergence in education seems to be in the high school, right? Not in the college level. Uh, yes, but the problem is the way. So you, you're referring to the curve here that I for, like I, I skipped over because I'm I'm always trying to run for time. But this is largely because of the way that it's defined. Uh, the way it's defined is that in the census, they said something like uh, some university education, some technical education, and got a degree. And they say got a degree, whatever it is. Uh, so here, what we did is with a university degree, there was a large proportion of francophones that actually went to university and got some university. So if we had plotted with some any form of graduate studies, you would find that there's a convergence. So here it's because of the way they're coded. They're like dummies in a certain way, rather than being number of schooling years. When we attribute, by the way, like mean values for each categories, uh, we find that the average years of schooling for the French uh, like has like a, nearly of a straight line like this over time. But so this is like the financial sector, you'd require university degree, right? Not just years of college. Uh, yes and no. There was a lot of, uh, I mean, this is, I don't have evidence on this, but most of uh, what I read was a lot of the financial sector in which the Francophones, for example, got heavily involved was uh, insurance. And here there were people who had started as a bank clerk, got rapidly promoted, uh, then moved to the financial, to the insurance sector. And, uh, but there wasn't a large proportion of them that were necessarily university educated. Uh, so, sorry, that got a degree, but they had some university education uh, is the answer. So uh, it's not as clear with regards to, to university. So yes. Uh, which one did I do? Oh, yeah, I did the capital one. So we see that there is now more capital flowing to French speakers. The other part is that we can also check if the relative, if the, the returns to education, if there is uh, a lesser return for French speakers than for English speakers. And here what you have is an interaction term between if you're a francophone and if you have a high school degree. And you can see that the uh, wage penalty, so sorry, not the wage penalty, the difference. So imagine like in the regression, you have your returns to high school degree. And if you're a Francophone, you take this much out from the university, the, 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 the returns that you find in the regression tables. So you see that it's actually falling over time. And it's also falling over time for universities. So overall, what you find is that the relative returns are converging. So the Francophones and Anglophones before had this much of a gap in terms of their, their earnings. Now it's this gap, this gap, and it closes gradually over time as you move, not over time, over cohorts. So if you move towards the younger cohorts, the younger cohorts still, at least with regards to high school, have somewhat of a, of, of, have somewhat lower returns than the English, but much less so than older cohorts. So that, the, so that rates of educational returns are converging. And the last part is returns to, so not observation number three that we should see is seen. And the last one is returns to bilingualism. And here we do three, uh, we have the same two sets of regression that I showed you when I started uh, the presentation, but now we also had one where we control for the differences in returns to education. And in all cases, what you find is that the wage premium that's associated with being bilingual is falling over time and uh, over time, sorry, over cohorts. Uh, so you can see that it's falling. So there's lesser return from learning another language. And not only that, but that's the part I think is uh, the big kicker is until 1951, uh, rates, so, and this is by census, so census of 1901, census of 1911, 21, 31, 
uh, 41 and 51, you see that there is a very mild increase in the rates of bilingualism amongst French speakers. But after 1951, rates of bilingualism amongst French speakers falls. So that Francophones are becoming less and less bilingual over time. They are less inclined to learn English. And the big kicker is the English speakers are actually learning French. So rather than having before you had people trying to cross from the Francophone sector to the Anglophone sector, now you get some Anglophones trying to cross into the Francophone uh, sector. So this way that we have of conceptualizing the shock of education as uh, the shock of the educational reform as a way to break the, the equilibrium uh, allows us to uh, show that there was an, an, a particular equilibrium before where there was a large wage gap between the two groups. The educational reform increased the stock of human capital uh, by force in the French group. And in doing so, what it did is it, caught, it allowed the French group to converge, even though there was still a cost from moving between the French and, and English group. Because the, the one last thing I'll mention is if, the, if it had been the cost of moving between the two groups uh, that would have fallen, you would have seen that uh, you wouldn't have seen something like rising nationalism or something like greater levels of distanciation between French and English. You would have seen them become more and more like one group because then the two curves would have been moving together. If you're thinking of them as two solo curves, they'd be, they'd be converging. Here, what we're showing is that you still have two different sectors with, uh, with still a cost from moving between them, but because there's been a shock to the education of the Francophone sectors, they're not that far apart, but even though they're culturally distinct. So that's our, our explanation, uh, so that there isn't convergence over time, there is convergence across cohorts and it's best seen through this mechanism of the big shock that the law of 1943 uh, produces and here is the the thing i, I think uh, could gain and i'm not here i'm uh, i'll try to be modest but julien uh, is julien is an incredibly smarter guy than i am uh and i'm not i'm not trying to say this facetiously or like fake modesty julien is incredibly brilliant he pointed out that uh, you can tweak this model and apply it to any form of setting where there are two different groups or multiple groups that have persistent inequalities between them and that then resorb rapidly through either legislative shocks, big institutional reforms, such as, for example, and that's his point, I'm not, I'm not saying that you can take exactly what we did and apply it to the United States, but some of that logic could be applied, for example, and is somewhat, by the way, I can, you can find some of it in uh, Gavin Wright's uh, story about sharing the prize on civil rights in the United States. Something similar uh, could be translated to, to the US. I've run through the paper. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I tried to go as fast as possible. There's probably a few things I forgot to say uh, because I, we had an hour and I wanna have questions. If I forgot anything, if I slighted anyone, it's by accident, it's because the format is not, like, I mean, we're on Zoom, so I apologize if I did anything wrong. And- uh, Oh, no, of course you didn't. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Vincent. So if you have any questions, you can just like start talking or you can put them in the queue. Um, I'll, just, I'll just start off since I'm already talking. I don't, what I don't understand here is how, okay, so you have this undereducated relative to the returns population. So apparently this compulsory schooling law has a very big effect. I didn't, I, I didn't catch exactly what that was, um, but the rest of Canada still exists. So there's always gonna be a higher return to education in English than there will be in French. That's the whole reason they needed to regulate immigrant schooling behavior, right? So I guess I don't understand how even with really onerous compulsory schooling laws, you would ever expect to get rid of this wage gap. Um, there's many ways to answer your question, and maybe there's something I miscommunicated, but I'd say it like that. I wouldn't remove any importance to the changes of the 70s, right? I'm not trying to say that our thing explains it all. No, I'm just saying the law in the 70s shows that, you know, in the absence of regulation, people will select into being educated, 
in the language that has the biggest economic return because again there's Canada is this big country where everyone else is speaking English so I what I, I it's not about this I don't think any of this is driven by the law in the 70s I'm just saying that the law in the 70s to some extent demonstrates the fact that there should still be a gap even with the story uh like this yes. last bullet point here where the problem of immobile labor is solved by equalizing human oh, capital endowments i just don't quite understand okay so i think here I, I i forgot a key nuance i mean all else being equal right because there is still a uh if we look at the initial graphs all right uh ta -da -da, um, oops sorry let me move because you guys are you're seeing yourself it's probably like a loop uh, there's still a gap uh that, there's still a small gap that exists today when you don't control it's only after you control that there is still some of a gap that that uh that there is a reversal so it's because you're you're we're not like for example like in this one we're not showing uh we're not controlling for the education, the sec sorry, the sectors in which they're in. We're not controlling for education. There are still some gaps, for example, in the number of years that the French have today than the English speakers have in, in Quebec. Uh, the other part is, and I'm not sure how to relate it to your question directly, I'm a, like I'm trying to flesh it in my head, is that the Francophones don't leave Quebec that much. Uh, there is some uh, migration out of Quebec from Francophones, but it's a very small trickle. No, but the other guys do. That's yeah, the, the, the ones who can speak English do. Yes. So there's there there has been departure. Uh, so I'd be willing to say that, for example, and that was I think the, the reply that was provided earlier. Uh, there's probably a part of the gap that was closed by the fact that after the law is passed, the 1977 law, a lot of English speakers leave uh, the province, so that you lose a lot of. Uh, highly skilled uh, English workers, but it wouldn't explain the convergence that we see in younger cohorts uh, over time uh, and this kind of uh, composition effect that we're mentioning. I, I'm not, what I'm basically trying to say is if I'm trying to reweight the attention of the literature, which has gone nearly exclusively to the laws beforehand, to giving a bigger weight to something that wasn't mentioned before, which is the 1943 law, as an important source of a break in the uh, the difference between both groups. I wouldn't be arrogant enough to attribute all of it to the educational change. No, of course not. Let me ask you this. How long do you think that 1943 law was binding? When binding, you said? Yes. Uh, like binding for a significant share of Francophone kids. Uh, well, uh, I would say until the 1970s. Here's why. Because uh, they kept tightening it afterwards. So it said you have to go to school until 14. Then they raised it to 15 in 1961. Uh, and they also started at that point also to have for in-province uh, Quebecers, so people who are born in Quebec, have what is called freeze tuition fees. So they cap tuition fees at a certain level for universities and made it actually subsidize it so that they were well below uh, uh, what the market would have normally bore for, for this training. Uh, so there's a series of educational reform that make persistence afterwards so they continue in a certain way, uh, but the law is itself, so the, the compulsory education law is tightened further in 1961, saying you have to go to school until age 15. Uh, and then a little bit later, I'm forgetting which year, uh, to age 16. So there's a series I okay, of I wouldn't have expected a 14 year leaving age to be binding for very long, but I don't know much about the Canadian context. Well, about the Quebec context. I'm hogging. Does anyone else have questions? Sorry, I spent entirely too much of my career thinking about compulsory schooling laws. It's hard not to stop. Desiree. Yes, I think um, it would be more convincing if we really knew what was driving that drop, like, because um, this, this graph here, you know, initially it's, it's 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 about the um, anglophones having you know a, a bigger drop basically and and if we can unpack it like what what is happening here which sectors are driving the drop is it like just anglophones leaving hi higher skilled anglophones leaving i mean it's i think here there's a lot of you can do a lot you can leverage it a lot if you unpack this thing 
Um, so it's just a bit striking. It looks really striking to me, like what Alison said at the beginning. It seems like the gap is being closed because um, the anglophones are earning much less. Are falling more than the French are falling. Uh, yes, so I'm. this is like the one thing that me, Marie-Pierre, and Julien are... So I said earlier that I, I was happy to say I have an answer for everything. That, that was a, a blatant lie, uh, which is that there is still that one thing that we can't explain. It's a question we keep getting. Uh, we're, we're trying, so the one, the one explanation we have is part that the, the large share of the English, not large share, a large number of English leave Quebec uh, in 1976 when the PQ wins uh, and a bit more after when they pass Bill 101. Um, uh, but it doesn't explain why it's also falling for the French. So that explanation doesn't, ex like it says, it explains why it would fall a bit for the English because it's the higher skilled English workers who are leaving, but it's not explaining why both groups have after 1970, a negative flow uh, in what happens. And the other explanation that we were looked at and we're not satisfied by it, but I'm gonna say it nevertheless, it's that uh, we see it in all the other provinces. So for Canadian borns, their wages are either stagnant or also falling uh, for Canadian born males, right? So we're still looking at only uh, dudes. I'm not saying male men's, right? Uh, male, sorry, that was a, I was trying to make a reference to a male. When you joke. said male workers, I was like, oh my God, male workers there too. Um, but it's no, just sorry, because was, of our political moment here. I, uh, uh, sorry, I was trying to make a joke. I don't know if it fell, I think it fell flat, but uh, uh, dudes basically is, uh, we're seeing the same thing in the other provinces. But I, beyond that, I'm unsatisfied with the answer I've given you, to be honest. So this is the classic way to reduce inequality in some circles, is to just get rid of all of your elites, right? Uh, if you just get rid of all the high earning Anglophiles, then that wage gap's just gonna shrink. It, 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 well, yes, it, it, it would, <laughs> if, if you kick them all out. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't understand why it would also have the French fall as well uh, in that process. Well, if you're, they're the job creators, right? That's the problem with the elites. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. I mean, this is not what your paper is about, but when I see that picture, it's just hard not to ask a bunch of questions on those. Uh, on those. Um, does anyone else have, I'll just stop talking for a second. Oh, yeah, Vincent, uh, great talk. Uh, when, when you said mail, of course, I thought you were going to start talking about your post office paper, but um, uh, no, I have I have too many papers on the grill as usual. Yeah, no, um, but uh, re related to that issue of uh, state capacity, I mean, I think the focus on education and these education reforms and, and, and the closing of the gap, I mean, this strikes me as very much in, in implication being that, um, you know, the government can do a lot to, uh, uh, to close identity-based uh, wage gaps, you know, and so I think, uh, you know, do you, do you see that when you look at this paper? I mean, you don't talk about, you know, the, the state much or the role of the state in education, but that seems to me to be a big implication of this. And that kind of gets to, you know, some of the things that Allison was talking about as well. Uh, I love that question because it, 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 it forces me to tie many of my papers to, to that one. Uh, but so here our objective was, so I, I should state it out, is that we are trying to argue that, and this was to respect an earlier school of thought that was centered around, for example, Jean-Luc Miguet of the, uh, who was back at that point at Université Laval. And he'd made this argument that there had been some reforms that had happened before in the 40s and 50s. And he mentioned very briefly the educational reform. He said reforms like these that would create large change, like these sometimes are long and they, they are when seeded, it takes a few years for the tree uh, to grow. So that was kind of the first part is that the good education, like reforms like these, where the state uh, not only provides, uh, forces well, does compulsory education, but also provides extra funding for it, uh, would have had this uh, additional, uh, uh, sorry, not additional, latent effect so that it would take time to, to mature is the first part. Uh, but it's also tied to two things I think are important. So one is the, a commentary on what I've just said, and one is somewhere where we wanna bring the research next, is the rise of Quebec nationalism in the 50s, 60s, and 70s doesn't grow out of nowhere. 
you needed to have had some prior conversions beforehand to get a group of francophones who were uh, motive, like for some reason motivated to push for political reform. So in a way, what we're kind of what we where we want to push next is why is it that uh, sorry to let me phrase it even simpler. Uh, the reforms in the 1970s, the laws in the 1970s are an outgrowth of earlier changes themselves. So when the Quebec state becomes, so state capacity is erected, but erected around French speakers, it's an outcome of the earlier reform of the 40s. So what we're trying to do with this paper is to change the focus on which gains in state capacity, changes in state capacities uh, and state priorities causes the, 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 ch the overall economic and social changes that are observed. So we're kind of trying to shift the focus from 1970 to earlier in time. So that's kind of my answer to this. Well, the, I, I, was, I don't, I, um, so it doesn't sound like there are any more uh, questions for right now. So since we're getting close to the end of our hour, um, Vincent will be able to stick around and chat with anyone who'd like some more low 